welcome everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Paul. As always, it's good to be here with you at OC Talk Radio, and I want to welcome all our listeners to the next chapter with Charlie. Now, today is an extra special day as we have with us in studio Leah Kagasa, who is Miss Uganda 2016. I'm so excited to interview Leah as she has lived a most interesting life from experienced life in a poverty stricken rural Uganda to life in a small city, on to an excellent public education, university, and then was surprised to run for and win the Miss Uganda beauty pageant in 2016. Currently, Leah is a fashion model, a representative of Uganda, and most importantly, a very active philanthropist. As a matter of fact, I met Leah when she became interested in representing Wells of Life and has since become a most impactful ambassador for our charity of drilling clean water, clean water wells in rural Uganda. So, Leah, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. I'm glad to be here. It's so great to have you here. So tell me, how are you enjoying your time here in Southern California? Um, I like it. I thought I'd find hotter weather, warmer <laughs> weather, Southern Californian weather. But it's a bit chilly, though, I guess because it's winter. So. Yeah, it, it's, it's as winter as we can get. This is We're reaching our cold spell now. You know, it gets all the way down to 50, oh, okay. which is, I don't know, Celsius. You know, that's probably, what, 10 or 11? Yeah, about like 10 or 11. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is not your first trip to Los Angeles, Southern California. You've been here two times in the past? Yeah, two times. This is my third. And and what were you doing in the past? Um, I was here to do a tour because of, I was Miss Uganda, so the community in the Ugandan community in Los Angeles for the first time invited me here in California yes. and uh, I did a tour I saw Rodeo Drive Walk of Fame oh did you oh you've yeah. already been to the Walk of Fame so yeah. we're planning to do that again Oh, I, I love being there. I've been there twice, and I'd love to go back the third time. <laughs> I know you love L.A. Yeah, I love L.A. <laughs> yeah, we went there yesterday. Tell me now, so you've been here now three times, mm -hmm. and y you, you've been in Kampala, the capital of Uganda, hundreds yeah. of times. Oh, what, yeah. What, what do you see the most significant differences, you know, just obvious differences between Southern California and Kampala? I'd say it's less crowded here, you know, less on crowded. the roads. Yeah, except for traffic except hours. Except for traffic hours, yeah. yeah. And also the roads are quite broad here compared to Uganda. You have about, what, seven lanes, four lanes, more. We have like two lanes in Uganda. Two lanes and a sidewalk. Two la and a sidewalk, yeah. <laughs> two that you drive on. Yeah, three maximum, really, but it's usually two lanes. Yeah. Yeah, I know that was the first thing that our uh, country director, when he was here last year, Adrian mm. Laurentu, and he said, I, I, can't, I can't believe the size of the roads. This is, And then everybody really stays in the roads compared to yeah, Kampala. Yeah. It's, like, it's not like three roads. It's like <laughs> one road, everybody fighting. Exactly. Yeah. But not, not on all roads, but on some roads when, there's, when there are traffic hours, people want to get out of traffic, so they're just going to try to... You know, even drive on the sidewalk, which is... Oh, oh, I know. It's, it's just it's, not it's here, just, yeah. it's just amazing to get through y Uganda. It's probably no more than five miles, mm -hmm. you know, to to pass through to go, like, to Jinja if you're going from one end to the other end. Yeah, yeah. And it can take up to two hours. It can. To go... The traffic is... It's insane. And I know I noticed also you guys you guys said one of the differences in the highways is my driving. I drive so fast. Oh yeah. Fast. Oh yeah, Charlie, you drive so fast. We don't drive that fast in Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> well it's fun. Yeah. Leah, I'm interested in your background. Mm -hmm. You told me that in your early years you experienced life in rural villages, so the poverty of rural villages. Yeah. What is life like in a village in Uganda where there is no clean water, no electricity, no toilets, you're living on dirt floors? Tell, tell, me, tell me about that. I mean, when you grow up in, an, in a village like that, that is all you know. You don't know better. 
you get up in the morning you know as a child probably go to fetch water if you have a, if you if you have an opportunity to go to school you go to school after you know doing the house chores and fetching water and all that and also you know we use we use pit latrines they're not toilets in the villages so it's it's not good but it's pretty much what you know so you don't know what to compare you don't know what to compare it to you know that makes sense yes. yeah you don't know what to compare it to so people are you know it's not it's not the best situation for anybody to live in for the rest of their lives but then as you grow up you start seeing better and you think okay i need to have better than what i have and you see newspapers you see the city and you say i need to live like this so, so is that is that true for for most for most youths in in Uganda that they see that there is a better life possible and so it's yes. it's hard yes yes for most youth and some of them you know we have a, if you've been to Kampala right yes so you've seen the children begging on the street yes so they just get on to on buses and they, they i don't know how they afford a, uh, probably a, a bus ticket but they get on a bus and they come to just beg on the street because they want to get out of the villages and out of that life you know it's dangerous on the street in kampala as well but then they prefer that compared to being in the village where there's no water and you know where you have to work for you know toil for everything you know probably even the shelter is, is there's no proper shelter the roof is leaking it's it's bad. Yeah, yes. in the villages, it's bad. And I understand with the children in the streets, there are, mm, it's not cartels, but it's individuals that will act, gather children. Yeah. And then have them collect money, and then the children have, yeah. children have to go back and give, and give, that money. And give the money yeah. to these individuals, and they don't, they don't get to keep very much of it. Yeah, but they do that because they know there's going to be shelter, there's going to be at least food, there's going to be some water. You know, and with the hope that probably someone is going to take pity on me and they'll adopt me, maybe. So it's... Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah it's the unfortunate. Is, yeah, it is so, so difficult. And, and, and what was interesting is that I was told that it's not legal to do that, but the people that are fined by the, by the police are the people that give... The money to the kids it's not they don't find the kids for asking for money no they, they don't find, find the kids for asking for money they find the they find the people who give the money oh i mean i don't know that yet because i mean when i'm driving in kampala i can i can yeah. give some money to you know the person who comes to beg for some on my car window yeah and i've never been fined for that yeah adrian that's what adrian our our country director told me oh maybe he fessed something like that. <laughs> who knows yeah so you you spoke earlier and and with wells of life we talk a lot about fetching water that you fetched water yourself yeah i did i did i, I did um you know like you know we've had a, this conversation before but i can say it here again my parents are teachers yeah. Yes. But when we have holidays, and they are not teachers in the big city, they are teachers in the you know in what you call up country. Right. Right. Yeah. So they're not in the rural village except Ex- exclusively. It's it's in a smaller city. It's, in a, it's not even a city. It's like a smaller town. Yes. It's yeah. just it's just a road with a bunch of you buildings know, on it. Exactly. So during the holidays, you know, when this when school breaks. Because they're secondary school teachers, so there's going to be a holiday when when school breaks. We'd go to the village. But, for how long? I mean, for like a month or more. Okay. You know? But this is every three months you break off, you know, from school. Okay. But when we go back home in the village, it's the same setting. There's no, no electricity, no, no water, no, like, direct water. Maybe right. rainwater sometimes because it rains. Right. Thankfully. And, uh... You know, there's a pit latrine, just like the setting that, you know, you talked so, about. But you were actually fetching water, so you were carrying... Yeah, and, we'd carry and like uh, 20 liter jerrycans. I mean, I was like, what, 13? Five, uh, 20 liters? Yeah, I, can, I could carry 20 liters. I mean, because that's what you know, that's what you see everyone doing, well, so that's you right, do because it. That, that, that's right, it, it's, it's and it uh, saves time. four gallons or five mm-hmm. gallons. So you don't want to go back and forth, and you're like, you know, let me just do... <laughs> And Maybe they weigh, carry. and they weigh, you know, for us, 40 pounds. I don't know how many kilos that is, but... Oh. 
but it's quite it's quite heavy. heavy. Yeah, it's quite he- quite yeah. heavy. And how far do you how far do you travel? I mean, um, like one and a half kilometers because to get to the river you'd have to, and it's not it's not a straight path. It's like a a hill. You go down the hill. Oh, there's I like know. a forest. I've seen it. Yeah, you've seen it. <laughs> it's terrible. It's yeah. it's terrible. I can't walk it. I can't walk it without carrying anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm, I am so, I'm so amazed, and and the children who live in the villages, so they miss part of school because they have to fetch water yes. because it's m- mostly children, young and, girls, and women, and, and women. women, yeah, yeah, and women that are doing the the water fetching, yeah, because the men have to probably graze the cattle. F- uh, Split the firewood that that is going to be used to cook the food, because we cook on it. We cook on an open fire. We don't have ovens or. Yes, yeah. I know. I've seen that. It's just it, it is just sticks and and a and a and, pot. Yeah. And a pot on top of that, and that's right in the middle of the of the house. Right in the middle of the, or is yeah. that outside the house? It could be outside, or they just build like a a shack with like some iron sheets, you know, or with a. Uh, you know, temporary housing for that. There's uh, mud, but dried mud. Right, dried mud housing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah on on some kind of wire base or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like yes. that. Yes. Yes, Which could be washed roof. away if there's if there's a heavy rain. Oh, really? If a storm, it can just wash away. So, yeah, but then that's the lifestyle there. It's not good. But that's what people have. That's what they try to work with. Yeah, that's why. That's why you know when we when we with wells of life when we when we are fortunate to be able to drill a water in a village, mm. the happiness and the joy and the people oh, yeah. is just. They give, you know. I've been there with Adrian, and they just give gifts. They give chicken. They give, you know, a bunch of matoke bananas. We call it matoke. Yeah, matoke. Yeah, bananas. They're just very very happy because, and that's. They said that's the best they can give, you know, but it's from their heart they're very grateful. It is so. It is so interesting for us when we travel there, and um, they give us a gift, and we know how meaningful this gift is. Mm. They give us a chicken, mm-hmm. but then as Americans going back to a hotel, what are we going to do with the chicken? Mm. And you can't give it back to them because no. that's insulting. Yeah, that's insulting. And we don't want to insult them, so there's always that. You know, you know, we <laughs> receive just a wonderful gift. Yeah, we're saying, but but what do we do with this gift? <laughs> um, but but so you know from personal experience. What it's like for for these rural Ugandans? Yes, I do. How difficult it is. I Does do so? Did your life in villages have anything to do with your? Because you have such a passion for service and philanthropy. Did did the villages that that life in a village impact your desire for service and philanthropy? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Um, when I got a chance at having a better life, you know, I thought, how can I give back? Because when you grow up. At first, you think it's normal, and then, like I said previously, and then until you see better, and you say, "Okay, if I get this, maybe I can find a way to help someone who lived like me or who is living like me right now, to get a chance at the life that I have." So that's what sparked everything. And of course, being in participating in Miss Uganda and working with charities and just seeing lifestyles that were even worse than the lifestyle that I grew up in. Oh, that sparked my love for philanthropy. So, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I so admire you that, that you, you know, you have a, you have a job as a model, and you, you could leave Uganda and just live in the United States and mm-hmm. figure out a lifestyle here and forget that. But you go back to serve and to help, to help your 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 friends and your people and. And I find that so admirable. Not not a lot of people do that. They they find success and say, "Man, I'm out of here." And you say, "No, I'm back in the middle of it, seeing what I can do to help it." Yeah. Leah, I think that's so impressive. Thank you, Charlie. Now, my intent for our time together is is to spend a lot of time on your service desires, but I can't help but first 
let's talk about your path to becoming Miss Uganda. I mean, not everybody gets to be Miss Uganda. Only yep. only one woman. Only one woman. Only one woman gets to be Uganda and Miss Uganda. So, as a young girl, did you participate in beauty pageants, and that was a goal in your life to be to be Miss Uganda? Not at all. I mm-hmm. didn't. No, not at all. We don't have beauty. I mean, now they're there, but when I was growing up, there were no beauty pageants, and I'd never been to Kampala till I was almost 18 years old. So you'd so, never been to the big city till no, you were I'd, almost 18. No, I'd never been. I used to see it on TV and in the newspapers. No <laughs> kidding. So you really were out there in what we call the boonies. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's amazing because here in the United States. You know, to be to win a beauty pageant, they you know they start at seven or eight years old mm-hmm. with parents that are you know taking them to all sorts of pageants and and who knows how many who knows how many face jobs they've oh, had. And, you yeah, know. I've seen that on the on on YouTube, but you know because the the people who hold the pageants back in Uganda they know that. Not everyone has, you know, has been fortunate to grow up rich to afford all that that, that you're talking about. You know, the training for beauty pageants and what and what not. So they give an opportunity to everybody to participate. And so, how much training was involved to become the process of becoming Miss Uganda? Um, okay, minus the application process because you apply. You would apply, fill in the form, and then from the form, they, there were like 5,000 forms. Then out of the 5,000, they choose about 200. Then they meet the 200. From the 200, they choose the 21. And then for three weeks, they're teaching them how to, you know, remain poised, how to speak in public, how to, you know, oh, really? is how it, to become is it ladies. A, is it a good education? It is a good education for three weeks. I think every lady should go through that. My friends at university had gone through it. That's the one thing that made me want to participate in Miss Uganda because I saw them change, you know, but like... How did they change? I mean, they were more poised the way they talked because their English was more polished. So I said, you know what? This is something I want and it's just three weeks if I win, wonderful. If I don't win, it's still a win-win. Yes, I, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Because I was, I was going to ask what made you, what made you wanted to, um, want to pursue this opportunity, and that's the, yeah, that's, that's the reason. Was, that's the reason. I wanted to be more poised, and you know, to speak better, of course, and to also build my network because you're exposed to different people, and it was. One of the things, yeah, one of the one of the things that I could do to get that. That shows that shows your desire for, for improvement because I, I know you have a you have a desire to do better, get better, yeah. and and <laughs> and and perform better. Uh, I want to spend time in talking about your your philanthropy and your service but before we do we're going to take a brief break all right charlie You're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and this is Charlie Hedges, and today is a special day as we are visiting with with Leah Kagasa, who is Miss Uganda 2016, and, you know, it's interesting talking to her about, about the process of becoming Miss Uganda, but we're really here because Leah is, is very interested in service and philanthropy, and not gaining wealth and popularity in order to leave Uganda and, and li- li- live a better lifestyle somewhere, but she wants to go back to Uganda and help people. So um, one thing that as we've chatted, one thing about becoming Miss Uganda 
is it opened doors for you yeah. that you wouldn't have had before? What? Tell me about that. What kinds of doors did that open for you? What kind of opportunities did that give you? I, I traveled a bit more. I'd never been outside Uganda on an airplane until after Miss Uganda. Uh, so. And how old were you then? I was 21, I think. 21? Yeah, 21 when I competed. So for the very first time, I was able to travel out and out of Uganda. And it also opened doors to to you know to participate in you know the big pageant miss world uh that i'd never thought i'd ever participate in because of my background you know um it opened me up to different people you know my network grew and also i started helping you know i i saw different you know like that's through miss uganda i met wells of life if it wasn't for miss uganda i would never have met wells of life yeah, and you know? we would have we would have been the ones missing out. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> it's bo- it's it's both ways, you know. And uh, cuz I love I love giving, but it gave me a platform to be able, you know, I mean besides all this nice stuff and, you know, traveling, it is the it gave me a platform to express myself. It gave me a platform to give. Gave me a platform to be able to go to, you know, to schools and talk to young young, you know, young what do you call the young adults, really, but they're not adolescents. Adults, but adolescents, yes. yeah, adolescents and teenagers, and you know, to share with them the things that I I wish had been shared with me when I was that age, and to also raise funds and to raise awareness for different causes, and uh, yeah, so that's some of. But the with the children, that. you have a you have an impact because you know now you're you're certainly a young adult. You're not an adolescent, but you're closer yeah. to their age than. Charlie at 70 years old is and so they can they can relate to you yeah. so much more isn't that true yeah they can they can and that's why I do it because I know that if someone much older would talk to them they'd say ah oh, okay this one looks like our teachers this one looks like our headmistress but if I go and talk to them they say okay she's been there and she was she overcame the things that we are trying to overcome and she reached her dreams and she's still dreaming more so you know I can do exactly what she did so i encourage them to stay in school because education is important you know and yeah charlie that's uh that that that's really that's really wonderful and mm-hmm. it you know what one of the things that that strikes me as, as we were talking that this opportunity as miss uganda has given you an opportunity as a woman yeah to do this rather than men, you know, all the men in the politics and mm. the women. Tell me, uh, it just leads me to wonder about the expanding roles for women in Uganda. Are there, are there any women in power in Uganda? Yeah, we have some, but they're not. Okay, we have the Speaker of Parliament. She's, she's I think, the most powerful woman in the country right now, the Speaker of Parliament. And, of course, the First Lady, because she's the First Lady. But the Speaker of Parliament is the most important woman in the country and uh we're so glad that they met that it's a woman that they chose to be a speaker of parliament it's not 50 50 there's no equality but it's it's starting to get there because now people are speaking up about gender equality and and are they, where are they speaking is it, is it in the schools or is it just in the politics both both yeah both that's both great so politics. gender equality it really is an uh, an issue that's talked about in in Uganda. Yes, it is. It is. We're that's starting to, you know, before the men were not comfortable <laughs> with it because of their egos and, you know, as an African society, the men are always on top. But with the changing world and people getting exposed, we've, you know, the conversation has been sparked and now people talk about it and people are starting to open up. Though it's not yet at fifty fifty, it's not yet at where there's fifty percent. Male, fifty percent female. You know, the males still have a higher percentage in roles of leadership and everywhere from the private sector to the governments to schools. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and it's even the the lack of equality is even the the lower down you go on the scale, like in the rural villages, mm. the men have absolute total control. Yeah, they do. They do. And you know that because they're the head. They they're the head of they the family. They take any money so that's take, made. That yeah. all goes to them. Yes, yes. Because the women there are not exposed to know 
their rights. Some women don't even know their rights. They, so the, the men are very dominant in the villages. That's why when we, when we go and we, and we establish a well, one of the things we do when we, when we drill a well mm. is that we create what's called a water user committee. And it has 11 individuals on the water user committee. And we require a minimum, a minimum yeah. of 40 percent women. And we're looking for 60 percent women, more women than men. More and women we, than men. That's because good. because the men or the women are the ones that are fetching the water. Yeah. So why should a man be telling them how to do this and what to do on it? Let This it is be. their job. Let it's them control it. That's why I love wells of life. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Thank you. But but that is that is uh uh really important and I and, and that I find that very interesting that, that gender equality in developing world is is growing, not just in the developed world, but in the developing world yeah. the gender equality is becoming important. It is. It is because now they they're seeing the role of a woman. Because the woman is important. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness! Are yeah. you kidding? Yeah, <laughs> there are, you know s- several of my my favorite leaders in the, in the United States are women. See? Yeah, uh, my wife and I are are very strong in this. This is this is very important to us. Mm. Now, also, uh, I was just curious about the women's um, the women's concerns in Uganda. Um, I know you are very active in service roles for children, adolescents, and young girls. Mm. What kinds of things do you do to assist these these children? What, what do you do, and what impacts do you make doing that? Um, what, like, what do you mean? What kind of in schools? You, you know, you're teaching like in schools. Yeah. Yes. I mean, when we go to schools, we teach adolescents about sexual reproductive health because that's the body changes a lot. You know, in that teenage, in the teen age, in that crazy and, adolescent yeah. years, where they're yeah, and then you know, we just teach them because we know that they're dealing with different things. The body's changing; their emotions are all over the place. So we just teach them how to handle that. It's not just me; I go with a team, of course. It's not; I'm not the only one who goes to the schools. It's, I work with a team, but you know, we teach them that. Then, you know, we also tell them that it's normal to go through it. It's not an abnormal thing, but then. You know, that's why we ha- there are senior senior teachers, senior women teachers, or senior men teachers in schools. So we also meet with the teachers. It's not just the the students that we meet with. We meet with the teachers as well, and we tell them that, you know, do not treat these 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 kids harshly. You know, right? Don't treat right. them harshly. Just, but just lead them because I'm not going to be at the school every day. But the senior teachers are there every day. So, yeah, I'm. W- one of the issues that has come up in our WASH program, which is water sanitation and hygiene, mm, and mm. so we, we deal a lot with sanitation and hygiene. And one of the issues I think we weren't anticipating, but that has really become an issue, yeah. is menstrual, hy- menstrual hygiene. Yep. And that the women, the thing that, that really troubles me as a man, is that the boys make fun of the girls. Yeah, it's... It's it's horrible. It's I mean, horrible. Yeah, because they, they have the girls have no control over it. Yeah, and we saw a video yesterday where they're throwing stones at the, at girls, yeah, and yeah. you know it's just you know in mockery and laughing, and and so the education there, it's two different kinds of education. It's education of of the girls of how to how to do menstrual hygiene safer and and yeah and also teach the boys and how to, to teach the boys that it's a normal thing for the girls to be going through and that they should support how this. do the boys take that leah um do they listen you know, yes they do listen because we we go with a male as well to teach to the, when we're going to the school so they so because we because we know that they're going to listen to that male you know we have to find a way to <laughs> communicate better so we know that the male is going to communicate and tell them that you know these are Imagine it's your mother that, you know, they were laughing at 20, 40 years ago. How would you feel? So then, you know, they, we get into their emotions and we show them that it's important that the women are, that the girls in school are supported. And we believe that there is an impact because I've had people, you know, I've had people who have met me in Kampala, they, these young girls who have met me and they said, you know what, when you came to our school, you told us ABC and 
we followed it. Thank you so much. You are, you're my role model. And I don't remember their faces, but they remember me. And they remember exactly what, most importantly, they remember what I told them. So. Yes, and it, and and so and you you have to be such a symbol of hope. Yeah, that you know you can you can you can come out of this, mm. and and there is hope if you if you're able to study and work hard and Absolutely. make it make it your your goal Absolutely, to yeah. to improve yourself. Um, I was I was just thinking of a very important question, and it and it lost my mind here. I I'm always losing my mind. That it had to do with, with the boys. Oh, that we saw yesterday. You and I watched a video from Bangladesh. Yep. And a young girl was so embarrassed because the latrines and the toilets are so bad at the school. And we always encourage when we're building latrines at schools to have a boys section and, and a girls, girls section. section. And many of them don't. Yeah. They have that. And so the girl would walk a mile home to go to the, to to the, the bathroom. bathroom and then walk a mile back during school. So she's missing. She's missing uh, out on. You know, an hour at least of school. Or more. Or of more. School. Because you don't know. It's not a straight road. Yeah, there are corners. That's right. Yeah. And there's hills. <laughs> and there's and, hills, yeah. Yeah. That's, um, th- that's so hard for us to understand, you know, in the United States when we have. Yeah, everything. Not only you not have proper only infrastructure. Toilets. Yeah. Well, you just imagine not having that. That's the best. That's the best thing I can tell you. Like, just imagine not having that. Imagine having to, you know, go through uh, probably the woods. Here you have forests. What you call the woods, right? Yes. Imagine having to go through the woods to find the, you know, to go to school and not having a road, a straight road. That is going to lead to school. Right, just a oh, path, and just, just a, a path. path in the bush. And the bush, and boys being there and just laughing at you or teasing you, and oh, do they and hide? not, do they and hide not feeling safe. Things? Yeah, some of them do. Some of them do, and 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 uh, and not feeling safe. But if there was, you know, proper, you know, if there were there was a proper toilet at school, if there was water flowing, the people, the you know, students wouldn't have this. You know what I mean? Yes, I understand exactly what you mean, and mm. and you know part of the problem, as I see it, is 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 lack of leadership by fathers. The fathers are not telling the boys that this is inappropriate behavior, and I don't accept this, and yeah. that. But they come from an older generation, so it's going to. And take they were also not taught, so they think ah oh, he'll just figure it out, or the people the, the the girls will adjust like they've always adjusted, so. But it's it's going it's going to change. There's hope, Charlie. There's hope. It's not all bad. Yes, there 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 is there is there is hope. Um, tell me, as we're as we're nearing our our time here, mm. why did you choose Wells of Life as a charity that you might um, enjoy working with or feel that you could do some good with? Um, the solution that Wells of Life brings or provides it it's one of the human basic needs the most important human basic need which is water and it is a human right and it is ignored in my country you know because people think it's the way of life people should you know women should have to do this they should have to go long distances because it's it's been like that for generations yeah and it's hundreds in, of years uh, hundreds of years and it's ignored but they don't see the people. Who, okay, when it's ignored, they don't see that there is uh, product. You know, time that is spent that could be used to be for the women to be more productive. You know, right. and to cut that that poverty cycle because yes. water cuts deep. And the children in school. And the children in school and the safety of the people at home and and the diseases like you know. Cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, all those water related diseases. Yes. You know, and they think it's, you know, it's normal, they'll be fine, probably they'll use uh, traditional medication, but that doesn't work. And it's just, and it's, you know, it keeps people in that poverty cycle, not having clean water. Yes. You know, so when I heard about Wells of Life and what you do for the villages, and that you don't only create, you don't only provide a well, but you teach people sanitation and hygiene 
yes. through, your, through the WASH program. And it touched, it touched me a lot because I remember exactly how I grew up. I remember my village, how it looked like. I remembered going to those, you know, walking long distances to look for clean water from the river. I don't know if it was actually clean, but we used it. We brought it back at home and boiled it, yes. you know, um, to make it clean. So I thought this is an organization I'd like to represent because... It, you know, I'm emotionally attached to worlds of life. It's not just because of the work that you do. I'm really emotionally attached to worlds of life. That is, that is so gracious of you. We are so, we are so proud and honored to have you with us. Thank you, Charlie. That you, that, that you do all that what you do. Mm. I have um, one final question, Leah, as we come to our end, and yeah. this is um, on a completely different topic, but it's something that's curious to me. Okay, ask me. And that is. Um, does it ever frustrate you personally that people may focus on your beauty and ignore your intelligence and your heart for helping the poorest of the poor? Is yeah. that a frustrating thing to you? Yes, Charlie, it is frustrating. You know, when people back in my country, when they see a woman, the first thing they're going to look at is her looks. What does she look like before they even hear her out? So they, so the first, it's not all of the people, but some of them, or even a big the majority, the majority yes. yeah. And it's not a fun thing to go through, to be honest. So it's until you talk and they say, oh, okay, what is she going to say? You know, but for platforms like Miss Uganda, we've changed that. Yes. We've changed that. We've shown that it's not just a beautiful face, but it's someone who is going to stand up to people and talk to them and, you know, stand up to all those, the negativity that is going on in the society and to be a lady of substance and someone that people can look up to. So it's changing, but the process is no fun. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, the first time we met, yeah. I was struck by your intelligence and your your passion. It just... That Thank that you. I mean, you, you, your your beauty is obvious. Thank you. Thank and you. and so you're very beautiful. But but what really came through to me was that this is a very bright young woman, and a woman that really does care about people. And I, I think that's um, that's 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 so important. Uh, let you, me Charlie. let me ask you. I keep saying final question. This really is Paul the final question. Um, he's used to me. As we close our time together, yeah. and we talk about changing, about the changes you desire for the poorest of the poor, often referred to as the bottom billion. Mm. If you had the chance, if you had the power to help people in your rural Uganda, what do you think you would focus on first? Water. Water? Water, Charlie. That's the most important thing. Do you know we've done research on the poverty cycle, mm. the it's first the, element of the poverty cycle. Is lack of clean, sustainable water. Clean, sustainable, safe water. Sustainable, safe water, yes. That's great. Oh, my goodness. So how can people get in touch with you, Leah? I have an email address. I'm yet to put up my website, but my email address is Leah Kagasa. K A G A. K A K. Okay, L E A H. K A G A S A at gmail dot com, and I'll put that in the show notes so people will be able to read it in the show notes. All right, all so right. So I'll be able to get that. So Leah Kagasa, Miss Uganda, my friend, <laughs> thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you for having me, Charlie. It's my pleasure, uh, and I also want to thank all our listeners for tuning into the next chapter with Charlie. And please be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now. Bye for now. <laughs>